we have an amazing panel of people here for a really insightful and super important discussion on the intersection of climate change and social justice and how imperialism underpins the climate crisis. We are recording this call, but it will only be the speakers who are seen. And then in a few days, it will be uploaded to our Just Stop Oil YouTube channel. And if you need it, um, our captions option is enabled, which you can find in the toolbar um, on your screen. This Zoom will be about, about 90 minutes. We'll have about an hour of um, the speakers, the panel, and then we'll be going into some breakout rooms. If there are any trolls um, or any disrespectful or discriminatory behavior that we see, um, please let the co-hosts and the tech know and they can deal with this. If you don't already have it actually during this call, we're asking people who are interested in joining Just Up Oil to please download Signal Messenger. It's through Signal that we can communicate and you can be linked to the groups that best suit you and really integrate you into the community. Um, for those of our audience who identify as, as BAPOC, that's Black, Asian, Indigenous, people of colour and mixed race people, if you're interested in joining our Just Stop Oil's BAPOC community, um, then you can also let one of our co-hosts know or a facilitator in the breakout rooms at the end of the call. And you'll be joined by me, I'm in that community, and also uh, one of our speakers tonight, Adil, as well. Um, and the links for that should be in the chat. So I'm so honoured to be facilitating this discussion tonight. Um, my name is Bea, Bea Chinieri, and I am of Armenian, Nigerian, Igbo, and British heritage, and I'm from London. I was really raised by a, a father who taught me the value and the joy of, of Black power. I was I was raised with a lot of black literature, the Black Panthers, NWA and, and Herbie Hancock. These were really my lullaby and what really shaped me and grew me. My first protest was when I was about 10 years old um, and it was against the white fascist political group, the British National Party. I remember a member of the police coming up to us and seeing my dad and telling us that we had to leave the, the protest area because we shouldn't be there. And it was one of my, my early memories where I started to realize there's a difference in experience and treatment and justice that black and brown people can have. And at 10 years old, I just thought, fuck that. And I joined in with the, the counter protesters. I had men double my size, screaming, spitting hate um, in my face. And in retaliation, we just sort of sang back and sang about unity. And it felt so empowering to watch these angry men just halt in their tracks. And since then, partaking in, in civil rights felt like my calling. Social justice, is, it's in my bones, it's in my lineage. I believe it's our purpose as, as a humanity. But I very quickly realized that social justice was very deeply intersected and that the crux of this was the impending climate collapse. If civil rights led me to climate justice. I, I cannot see one without the other. Climate justice is social justice. Climate change is not only an environmental issue, but a social, political and economic issue because climate change disproportionately impact those who are facing systemic inequalities. People most affected by the climate crisis are predominantly people of color, those in the global south, and yet it is these communities who are least responsible, those who are most responsible for driving the excess of emissions are countries within the global north, and historically, their vehicle to drive this climate collapse was imperialism. In today's world, capitalism is the rebrand 
of imperialism and colonization. With neoliberal capitalism, corporations have unrestricted power to access and extract resources and exploit people for profit. They then, they then take this profit and pump it back into wealthy countries in the global north and not to the communities that they are taking it from. So it's really paramount that we use our power as people to resist against governments and corporations who are exploiting people and the planet. And it's really essential we analyze and discuss these links like we are going to do tonight, as it's a topic that in my opinion is not addressed sufficiently in the climate activism space. As a mixed race person, I am saddened by the lack of ethnic diversity I see within the global North climate justice movement. You know, we cannot be afraid to confront systemic inequalities and injustices. In order to create a powerful climate justice movement, people must feel they belong and it must be intersected and represent and be prepared to have constructive criticism. Unfortunately, even with this event today, it's evident, you know, much fewer people signed up in advance for this talk than the previous ones that we've just held. So we must address this and allow it to inform our growth. And that makes it even more important that after today, you, you share this talk when it's posted on our YouTube and you have this conversation with as many people as possible. Tonight, we will be hearing from six amazing humans talking about their unique experiences in the climate justice movement and how this is interconnected with the campaign to overcome imperialism and create greater social justice. They're from all over the world with different experiences and perspective. And it's this diversity of thought and knowledge which is essential to a flourishing social justice movement. The questions that we wanted to explore tonight are, how did imperial colonization impact climate change and communities of color? We want to address the issue of environmental racism and why is it that the climate justice movement in the global north is predominantly white? What needs to be done to address injustices and inequalities and intersect the climate movement so that we can unite and fight against climate, climate corruption and judicial corruption? So we hope that today we'll provide everyone with meaningful introspection. It will allow you to question, to learn, to unlearn, to relearn again. And after we hear from our panel tonight, we will have a bit of time for a, a small Q&A. So if you have, have anything that you'd like to ask our speakers or maybe a speaker in particular, then you can send a question uh, using the Q&A function in your toolbar. And the panel, as I said at the beginning, is followed by breakout rooms. And the breakout rooms are a space if you want to join a Just Stop Oil facilitator in a smaller room to discuss how you felt from the talk. This will last about 20 minutes. Before those breakout rooms, we will be launching a poll. It will take you two seconds to do. And this poll is just to see how maybe you might want to get involved in the movement. And there are really loads of different ways to get involved. Um, if a rest is something that you're not able to do, then the following are also really super important. So I'll just go through three ways that you can get involved. Um, one way you can get involved is volunteering. There's so much that goes on behind the scenes and every hand on deck is, is so valued. You can attend or host a local talk. You can ring people. You can do admin, video editing, police station support, well-being support, collaborating with other supporters in your area, leafleting, um, poster campaigns. There's a lot to do. The second way to begin getting involved is attending a non-violence training um, to learn the skills and the resilience to, to join us in civil resistance 
and feel part of our community of trust. And you meet loads of really amazing people there. So it's a really nice bonding time as well. And the third way to help is to donate. Um, this is not possible for everyone, but for those that are in a position to and can donate, maybe one hour's income a month. Um, so if you earn £10 an hour, you donate £10 a month or the price of a pint or a cup of coffee. Uh, if you're from London, pints are very expensive. So, um, you know, paying £6 a month, it's all really appreciated so that the, the fight can continue. And the links to that will be posted in the chat now. Some people might be interested in, in taking part in an action um, if you want to. Um, so if you are interested in that, then maybe let one of our co-hosts know or the breakout facilitators. Um, and you can go on the Just a Foil website to have a look as well. Uh, just remembering that the risk of arrest is quite high um, when we take action due to mainly the government's draconian attitude and cracking down on protesters. Okay, so that's enough Enough from me. Um, let us get started. I'm, our first speaker tonight is Valerie Brown. Valerie is the mother of four daughters and grandmother to 11 children. She joined Extinction Rebellion on the penultimate day of their April 2019 rebellion because she saw no African or Caribbean people in the climate and ecological breakdown protests. In 2020, she helped form Beyond Politics, or Burning Pink, which is an activist group and political party. Stepping out of her comfort zone, she entered the 2021 London mayoral campaign as a candidate, and her policy was that she would hand over all decision-making to the citizens of London through deliberative democracy, also known as citizens' assemblies. Her dream is to see the end of party politics and a new era of people empowerment across the globe. It's so great to have you here, uh, Valerie. Hi there. Um, I hope you can hear me because, you know, I'm embarrassed to say I'm in pret and and um, I have to do the Zoom from here. But can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Anyway, thanks everybody. Um, yeah, for being here. This, I just wanted to talk much more about environmental racism, as um, they have put it. Um, I woke up to the climate crisis very late in my life. I am 71 years old. And this happened for me when I, 2018, when I saw two documentaries and um, I read a book um, by Stephen Hawkins, which was called uh, Brief Answers to the Big Questions. Now, just jumping back a few decades, back in the 80s, I remember very clearly the news broke out about the climate, um, well, they called it global warming. And it was quite big news for, it seemed like, just a few days. And it was scary and serious. And then it just disappeared for decades. So that's why, although I'm ashamed to say, I only really woke up to that fact in 2018. In fact, I'm not blaming myself. What it highlights is the fact that this huge event happening in our world um, was kept away from the citizens of the world by and large. But in 2018, I understood that something really serious was happening, but I felt alone. I was crying all the time, even when I was on tube, I was like in grief. I mean, I'm a grandmother, you know, and I saw that my children, my grandchildren's future was totally at risk. And it, it, the threat was just tearing me apart, but I was alone. Friends didn't seem to understand and, and so on. But what also bothered me the most was that as an African, I had actually just been reading this big book about um, the, the real history of Africa, written by an African-American historian. 
and it was full of the stories, you know, the history of our great civilizations and so on. It was very academic. Um, but one of the things that I found out was that um, in the seventh century, there was the trans-Saharan slave trade, the trans-Saharan slave trade, where millions of African people were shipped across the desert um, to, to Arabian countries. There was suffering, perhaps some people say worse than the transatlantic slave trade. So we've had, as African people, some 13 centuries of slavery, of having our lives absolutely broken in pieces. And yet the wonderful thing is that we're still standing very strong. But unfortunately, what bothers me is that the powers that be, the first world, as they call themselves, the construct of it all, is all encompassing and hardly any country can escape it. Even the capitalism of it all, the arrogance of it all. I mean, even China with all this communism sort of succumbed to it uh, to some extent in the end. But we Africans have been through a massively painful journey, but we still laugh. I mean, we, we laugh more than most people do because we have inner strength and we have a deep wisdom for which I am always um, in awe of when I'm with African people and especially when I'm in Africa. But there is something really missing here. There is a climate crisis, a climate catastrophe. We're talking about losing this civilization. Maybe we deserve to lose it. I don't know because it's, it's created so much suffering for so many people. But as African people, people of African descent, I think that we have a collective wisdom. But we're not allowed to tap into it, to, to, to reveal it, to, uh, to dig, dig deep, to, to find it. Because the, the powers of capitalism actually have taken over um, people's souls. I mean, obviously in the Western world, I mean, we all know that we want to see something different. We want to see real democracy. We want to see people connected to, to nature. We want to see people connected to themselves, to each other, to love, to meaningful activity, not just that E word, which is the biggest swear word that I can think of, economics. All our lives now, what do politicians talk about all the time? Economics, economics. People are consumers, citizens are consumers. It's all about money. But actually, we are people. And we need to remember who we really are and stand up and protest for the right to have a future. The right to have not just a future, but a world where fairness, justice, and love actually is the most important thing. When I first heard about the climate crisis, I, it was at the time when the um, French Rebellion were folding up the uh, 2019 April Rebellion. And uh, it was a joy to me when I heard on the, on the um, television, also at that time, Theresa May announced um, the climate emergency. I thought, hallelujah, finally, these big leaders of ours have woken up. A few days later, she announced the, um, the go-ahead for the third runway at Heathrow Airport. Well, aviation, mass aviation, does not go with trying to reach the 1.5 degree um, um, decision made by the Paris Agreement that we mustn't go over. She, within a few days, betrayed the world. That's it. She betrayed all the people in Africa, the global south, who were already badly impacted by climate change. And it was fine by everybody. It was fine by the media. But it wasn't fine by me because I joined Extinction Rebellion. And I went from somebody who was just going there to tinker around and do a bit of admin to putting my hand up to fly a drone as a, the protest um, to close down Heathrow Airport. 
um, to show the world, to get the media attention about the third runway. And I did that action because I'm African. If I had been white, I probably wouldn't have done that action because there are loads of white people um, doing actions. They didn't need me, but there were no black people. And I thought, you know what? I'm a bit of an old lady, but I'm going to do this because I need to show my fellow people of African descent and Asians that we, we know about rebellion. We know about protest. We have heard Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela. You know, obviously there have been other people throughout the world, including this very country, UK, I mean, you know, in history, who have fought for the justice that they, they, they deserve. So we're not alone. This is how change happens. We ordinary people have to step up and find courage. You know, they say also that courage, the definition of courage, is when you do something, um, which is scary, I guess, not because you know the outcome is going to be wonderful and perfect and as you want it to be, but just because you have to do it. So, you know, all of us, and I pray, and I want African people to be almost at the forefront of these rebellions, this protest, because 13 centuries, we have been treated badly by the world, the first world, as they call it. The first world because they used us to make that money. We are the ones who fueled the slavery that fueled the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution that has finally created the destruction of the climate and ecological system. It started with us, but we're going to end it. We're going to rise up. And we're not going to fight. We're not, we're not Hamas. And I am so grateful that although we do fight from time to time, but we don't murder, we don't do this kind of stuff. I'm not even making a judgment, a bad judgment, because, you know, I understand where they're coming from, some extent. But human beings have to stop wars altogether. But protest, non-violent civil disobedience is the most powerful way to effect change. We know how to do this. We did it for the civil rights. Nelson Mandela did it. Um, 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 Extinction Rebellion has done it. JSO are doing it. There are protesters all around Europe and, and parts of the world doing it. Recently in Lebanon, out of um, a population of 4 million, 2 million people came out on the streets for months protesting for better government. It not matter if rich or poor, they were all there. So anyway, to end up my winner, little speech, my passion I want to see black people be at the forefront of this fight for change. And the change is systemic. We have to do more than just protest. About, you know, we need to change the very paradigm, that the very foundation that this world is built on. It was constructed by the same people who perpetrated slavery, colonization, and many of the ills of the world. We have to stop them from continuing. We ordinary people all around the world have to come together, not worrying about our color, our class, our religion or anything. We just come together and we will be powerful. They cannot stand in our way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, it's always such a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much. Next, we are hearing from Louis V.I. Louis is a mixed race rapper and singer and producer, born and bred in Queen's Crescent, North London. Um, he's a self-proclaimed massive nature geek, <laughs> having a degree in zoology and specialising in biodiversity, ecosystem conservation and restoration and sensory ecology. Louis spoke at COP26 about the colonial legacy of climate change and uses a mashup of music, documentary film, and his love of nature to inspire the young black and brown people from the diaspora who fall in love with science and this beautiful natural world. Louis's new album, Earthling, explores individualism, climate justice, race, love, colonialism, capitalism, and the state of our nation, and has earned massive press and radio support with a five-star review in The Guardian, 
Observer and Six Music and Critical Praise from Lauren Laverne, Mary Ann Hobbs and Giles Peterson. Louis, thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much for having me, man. <laughs> um, yeah, um, thank you so much as well, Valerie. That was very inspiring and um, just so on point as well. All very similar. Um, I guess, yeah, as I say, I'm, I I just got two worlds and I've recently tried been trying to bring these two worlds of my two loves, music and nature together. And a lot of it has come from a few key moments. One of them was um, seeing the island of Dominica, where my dad's side of the family is from, in the Caribbean, this beautiful little nature island, um, which is, because it's got black sand beaches, has been pretty much untouched because it hasn't got the awful um, tourism that some of the other islands have suffered from. Um, so it's pretty pristine and it's this bit of a paradise. But um, I was pulled in because uh, in 2017, a hurricane called Hurricane Maria pretty much all but obliterated the island. Um, and this hurricane was the strongest hurricane to ever make landfall. Um, it's the same hurricane that later hit Puerto Rico, but it hit Dominica first. And um, it's it was it was basically exacerbated by climate related uh, extreme weather. And it struck me as unbelievably unfair how this island of a population of 70,000 people who's contributed little to nothing to, to climate change and global warming um, and biodiversity loss has been put on the front line of this climate change and you know there's fur further to that point has already suffered from the col you know colonial history of 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 the transatlantic slave trade as well as years and years of colonialism after um and then you know i read that kind of led me to realize this is this is a bigger picture thing this is something that's going on across the world this is this is the global south is on the front lines of climate change caused by the lifestyles of the West. Um, but there was, I kind of looked deeper and deeper into this um, and, you know, and started to discover how deep this went. And this is, you know, it's essentially in short through using the exploitation of people and the natural environment as the very fuel for the industrial revolution, colonialism birthed the climate catastrophe we find ourselves in now. Now, I found growing up in London in a very multicultural, diverse place full of cultures from everywhere, especially when you grow up in a rough part of London, you get to hear every language and every culture from the day dot. But um, I found that none of my friends that were from the diaspora, so black and brown, black, brown, Asian friends, people that had the connection to these places that were on the front line didn't understand or even know about that connection. Um, and, you know, it was like, I had this kind of feeling where I was like, well, these, these flags that we're so proud to wave at carnival, um, that we're so proud to be from and the cultures that we keep close to us, these are the places on the front line, but we are living as diaspora and grown up in the places that have historically caused it, there's got to be something here. There's got to be a bridge built. Um, so I that kind of has become my my main effort, my theme. And I tackled it using music and made this album to try and make a new tool and new way of speaking about climate change that felt authentic to us. Because it wasn't just the level that these places you know, that we ancestrally come from as diaspora, they're all on the front line. But it's also us as diaspora in the West have been excluded from accessing nature, even in the places we grew up. Like, I don't need to probably tell anyone here, but going to nature in the countryside in in the UK um, is at best an othering experience. And at worst, you know, you're having racist uh, words thrown at you and and just be getting stares. And the point is, like Valerie was saying, man, these are our spaces, man. We are the original eco warriors. We're the original people that have that connection to the planet because when the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism happened, that was a, a purposeful um, and concerted 
effort to snip the connection, this neural connection that all humans have with nature, but particularly those of African descent um, and everyone that's connected to that and from places in the global south, from the island nations, indigenous nations, from Asia and everything else, we have this intrinsic deep connection that is still very much felt um, inside us, whether we know it or not, to the land, because it's, you know, our cultures, our language, our religions, our spirituality, our survival, our stories, our art, our music, everything was so inspired and come directly from nature. Nature's always been our muse. So, you know, through the colonial, colonial mindset, um, that's been at least been tried to be really severed. And it breaks my heart when I see, you know, young black and brown kids in London and in, in the cities, in the UK and America and Europe um, have a fear of nature even, like it's dirty. And it's it's actually what's going on is so to do with us in such a deep way because exactly as Valerie said, this whole cycle, this system, it sustained people that in that enslaved our ancestors and and created this whole mindset of extractivism, of treating nature like a, a source or a resource to be taken from, to turn into kind of lossless cash. Um, you know, seeing a tree and only seeing wood rather than what it, the intrinsic value it has as being an alive organism. That with the same people that have done that are the same people that are put have are still burning oil that are still putting us in these situations and extracting today and it's no you know it's no irony that it's the places that we're from that are feeling the climate change first so i just think it's 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 so there for for us to take over this space and it's about empowering each other and empowering younger people by putting ourselves there in spaces and showing that you know we have a right to claim and be occupying nature because nature is something that's so intrinsically part of us as humans and we need to defend it because we've been suffering for centuries like Valerie was saying we've we've had so much taken yet we're still standing resilient and I think there's a beautiful bridge to be built between uh, the diaspora uh, and the global self that we come from and we act in almost as moles in the west because we got voices and there's huge elections I mean this is if anything is a take home from this there's huge elections that will affect sadly the world that we, we live in and the bit our ability to fight climate change because there's an election coming up in the UK and the US. And I wish it, wish it wasn't so Western centric, but um, the fact is the people that could potentially get in will scupper a lot. And they are definitely the same people and come from the same ilk um, that perpetrated the colonialism in the first place. So yeah, what I would say, and I'm so, sorry that I have to leave, I'm gonna have to leave and catch a train after this, but I'm so happy to have been able to be part and speak. But yeah, feel that your right is to be and to reclaim nature because um, as black and brown and Asian people and people of the diaspora all over the world and the global south and indigenous people, we are the original connections to the land and we live on a paradise that could be a paradise again, um, especially if we get involved. And our narrative is one that comes from a deep understanding of how to be involved. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Lou. Um, thank you. It's so nice to see you again. Lou's a great friend of mine and his album is amazing. So please go check it out. It's really, really, really powerful. Um, so thank you. Our next panellist is the amazing Disha A. Ravi. Disha is a climate and environmental justice activist who founded Fridays for Future India in 2019. After seeing her family impacted by the water crisis, she became an activist advocating for better policies and governance for the climate and environmental sector. 
Disha is a writer passionate about making sure the voices of the most affected people in areas, uh, MAPA, are heard in climate conversations. It's, I'm so pleased to welcome uh, Disha. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I just wanted to start off with saying that if climate calamities were essentially on a menu card, my country, India, is already being offered the whole buffet. Um, so far, we've experienced flooding, cyclones, drought, and very recently, my country experienced heat waves. And a new study by PLOS Climate showed that 90% of India is vulnerable to the impact of heat waves. The climate crisis is not a future event. It is already here for us. And it's very hard to say that world leaders haven't done anything. They, they very much have. They colonized us in the global south. They plundered our lands, our people, and our culture. They may have left our countries, but they continue to grab land through their big corporations, extract from us through their fossil, fi fossil fuel industries, displace our people, to increase their profits. And most importantly, they shift the blame of the climate crisis on the Global South countries. And our attempt to take back our space and fight back for our planet is also being blocked. One example of this was during COP26. Uh, COP26 happened in Glasgow in Scotland. And it was in a event where less than 0.0004% of the population met to negotiate with the lives of the planet, of everyone on the planet. And it was criticized as the most exclusionary summit ever for civil society organizations, and especially people from the global south, and those with disabilities. COP26 coalition, a UK-based society coalition, of environmental NGOs mentioned that two thirds of the people who was who they were helping traveling to Glasgow were unable to make it because the UK restricted uh, put restrictions on visas, accreditation, and even COVID vaccination inequalities. And as a result of this, limited participation of people from the global south at COP and limited our seat at the table. Activists from the Global South who, after all these restrictions, managed to get there, were cut out from pictures and were excluded by media and were, as usual, not taken seriously. The exclusion of Global South is a very common theme in climate conversations and negotiations. When we are excluded, our voices are silenced. Our experiences go unheard, mostly deliberately silenced, as I like to say it. And the reality of the climate situation that is happening in global South countries is very blurred. It becomes a refusal to acknowledge the proximity of the climate crisis and casts it as a problem of the future when millions are dying today. Young people around the world are anxious about the future and very, very rightfully so. But having a walk focus on it suggests that the general populace would rather care about white children's future than caring about black, brown and indigenous people's present. And if this is to continue, we have already lost. To fight the systems that are responsible for the climate crisis, we need news organizations, we need activists and governments and a lot of agencies who are sitting at the, at the seat of power to acknowledge the urgency and proximity of the climate crisis. And most importantly, to acknowledge the historical role of colonialism and imperialism and the role it has played on the climate crisis in causing it today, and the role it, ha it has played to continue and the impacts we face today. 
to elicit climate action, we must first change these conversations. We must assume responsibility and we must, most importantly, live in the present. We need to strip environmentalism and climate action of its white top because currently we are pushing false solutions and shifting blame. And if currently we continue to do this, we are on the path where millions, even billions of Global South people and their lives will be sacrificed. So if we do not fight for the present, there is no future. Thank you so much, Tisha. Um, thank you. Such a powerful message of unity as, as well. I really appreciate you taking the time. I have a feeling as well, Tisha's time difference is, is quite significant. <laughs> um, it's like midnight or something. Um, where you are living. So thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, that's really, really inspiring. Now we're going to hear from um, Lazarus, Lazarus Tamana. Lazarus is an international activist, a defender of human rights, environmental and indigenous issues. Native of Bodo City in Gokana, local government area of Ogoni land, in River State, Nigeria. Lazarus is the president of the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People, M-O-S-O-P, in Nigeria. He has been a key member of the movement since 1991. He was the European coordinator from 1997 to 2020. Lazarus played a strategic role in the case of the indigenous Bodo people who successfully sued Shell in the London courts in 2014 for oil spills which occurred in Ogoniland in 2008. Last week, Lazarus held a demonstration against Shell's activities in the Niger Delta um, and that was outside King's Cross in London. So it's an honour to welcome um, Lazarus. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to be part of this um, gathering this evening. Um, the story of the Ogoni people is a story that um, started developing badly when the colonial master, that is the British government, facilitated mining lease to shell to mine oil in the Niger Delta, and particularly in Ogoni land. And they came in there uh, in the late 1950s. When they came in, our people didn't know or realize what they were to expect from them. They just came in and waved the piece of paper, the mining lease from the government and started bulldozing almost everywhere. And the Ogoni people, um, predominantly the Niger Delta people of Nigeria are subsistent farmers and fishermen who live on the land we depend on our rivers for our daily lives and for our means of livelihood. We farm and then we fish. Based on that, we are able to take care of our people, our generation, our children, send them to school with this, what we get from the land. So the land is extremely very, very close to us. So when our land is devastated, we are equally devastated as a result. Kensar we were of blessed memory, who was hung by the Nigerian government in 1995 for raising his voice about the pollution of shell in our environment said that land is the most valuable thing to humanity and we must cherish it. That is what 
we in Ogune land has been doing. Our forefathers did that, and this that sustained them. But when Shell came in 1958, all that changed. They started mining carelessly and destroying our environment for us. We didn't realize that what they were coming to do was pure destruction. They were not taking adequate care to maintain the environment. They were just polluting almost everywhere and polluting our land and polluting our rivers where we fish and our land where we farm. That has created a lot of difficulties for us in the 1950s. Before our people could realize the pollution was almost everywhere. And they started raising the issues to government and complained to Shell. But Shell was having none of that. They were constantly after the profit of the region. So they continued. Individually, we were protesting to the court, and, and sometimes they will just ignore you and your case will be in court for sometimes over 20 years, sometimes over 30 years. By the time you realize you are dead and they strike out the case. So in 1990, the Ogoni people were either to go into extinction or fight for their survival. We all decided that we were going to fight for our, our survival. And then the movement for the Ogoni people, Mosop, was formed. That was 1990. As an organization to protest against our environmental destruction, the human rights abuse that we were suffering from Shell, when we say anything, we were brutalized. They will send in the Nigerian military, they will send in the Nigerian police to brutalize our people. This was happening in the entire Niger Delta, not only in Ogoni land. This went on for so long, but we insisted and continue to present our case peacefully and non-violently up to today. Now, what people are calling climate change, we saw it coming 33 years ago when Mosul was formed, when we started raising the issue of changes in the pattern of our, uh, our crops, changing in the season. There were more rain or less in, in some areas and more in some areas. Even the sun, the time that we normally plant, our crops have been shifted. And we notice all these things and that. We started raising these issues. A lot of people ignored us. Shell was branding us terrorist organizations and so many other things um, were happening. But we insisted and started our campaign, took our campaign to the United Nations, took it to the European Union, took it to the African Union, and people started realizing that we were serious. We took it to the unrepresented nations and people's organization at The Hague, UMPO, which represented indigenous people all over the world and minorities of the world. We complain almost everywhere on that. Today, that same complaint is on. Shell has not shifted their position. The world is now beginning to understand that the fossil fuel extractors are those creating a lot of climate 
uncertainties and climate emergencies for us. That is what is happening. These minority companies who are living in opulence are, are destroying our planet for all of us. And governments all over the world are not having decisive action against these companies. United Nations have not been able to come up with a solution to deal with climate emergency. And if that is not done, definitely, and the way things are going, it is not going to be easy for any of us. Because whether you are in Australia, you are in, in North America, South America, you are in Europe or in Africa, climate emergency is real and it is coming to your region if it has not already arrived. So as activists, as people who are concerned about the world where we live, we have a responsibility to tackle the climate issue through various ways and that. Shell that has ravaged and destroyed the Ogoni environment, they are still polluting the Ogoni environment today. Last year, we had about five oil spills that happened. And Shell has not yet taken any responsibility. They have not paid anything to the community in respect of what has happened. This type of practice is what is going on in the entire Niger Delta. Now, on whose authority is Shell doing that? These are things that they cannot do it in the West. For instance, if you pollute River Thames with just a gallon of benzene, you will be prosecuted instantly. But Shell can spill millions of barrels of crude oil into our rivers, onto our land, and nothing happens. And this is what they have been doing. Creating a situation whereby what they do in the Niger Delta, they cannot do it in the West yet. I used to campaign quite a lot. And I've been going to Germany, going to Luxembourg, going to Europe, going to America, going to South America. There was an incident that happened in Berlin. Shell was begging some organizations to come and, and take money for development. But coming to Ogoniland just to provide water for clean drinking water, Shell will not. Not to talk about road or electricity for the host communities where they are operating from. This is their practice. If you come to Ogoni land today, you cannot see any presence of shell in terms of development. After 65 years of operation, that is why our people are extremely worried. What they have left with us is pollution, gas flaring, um, oil spears and all these other hazards as a result of hydrocarbon pollution. The health hazard is heavy on my people. The rates of miscarriages has increased. The rate of birth defects has increased as a result of these spill sites 
that we are living close to. Our women are just suffering unnecessarily. And there are no hospitals, proper hospitals to take care of them. These are worrying signs that we have to deal with. Our girls, the young people that are born, if you are lucky, you must support and you live close to those spear sites, your child might survive. After five years, if the child survived, then something else has happened. So these are the conditions that we are facing on a daily basis. And it has not stopped. I appealed to Shell in 2017 to screen the people for hydrocarbon pollution. Shell refused. They have the money to do that, so that we know exactly where these problems are coming from. So Shell has refused. Now, our environment is charged with hydrocarbon because of constant hydrocarbon pollution in the air, which is not allowing us to breathe very well. There are so many diseases that has come up which we cannot diagnose because we don't have the technology and the facility to be able to do this. Our means of livelihood by and large has been taken away from us because we cannot properly farm anymore because of pollution on the land and in the rivers. Our pattern of fishing has changed. Our pattern of farming has also changed because of so many things that has happened. If you want to fish in Ogoni now, you need trawler to go into the deep ocean to be able to make sense out of fishing, which was not the case many, many years before Shell came and when the pollution has not accumulated. We are extremely very concerned about these things and we have been raising these issues on a regular basis. Now, the case of the Ugoni people is a case of genocide. It's a case of racism. Without we, no doubt about it. Because the operation of Shell in the environment is what they cannot do in their home countries. And they are actually doing that and they are not prevented. Sometimes you take court, shell to court in Nigeria and your case will stay there for 20 years, 30 years on end. Sometimes they will give instruction for the case to be struck out of court. And that was why we are encouraging our people now to bring the case to London. In 2021, we won a landmark case that says that we can now bring all the cases to London. Now, in 2014, we also brought a case against Shell from the border community in the Niger Delta, and we were able to win Shell in London. Now, during the negotiation, Shell was supposed to do four things, pay compensation, clean the environment, remediate the environment, and restore the environment. From 2014 till now, Shell has just managed to pay the compensation reluctantly. The cleanup that was recommended, Shell is dragging her feet because they use local contractors, because they don't want to spend money. Local contractors who don't understand what remediation is are uh, those who are handling these cases. Now, they have not even got to the level of remediation, not to talk of restoration. That is the activities of Shell that we are facing on a daily basis and that. We talk about climate change, those are the issues bordering on climate change. We talk about racism, 
Those are the issues that is driving racism, colonial racism, and all those things like that. I am extremely very concerned because the Ogoni people have been suffering for 65 years now. And we have not seen any respite in our suffering. I, uh, I hope that with this level of interaction that we are having now, focusing on climate change, focusing on racism, that governments all over the world can make decisive actions to stop, particularly these fossil fuel companies, from destroying the planet for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Lazarus. Such important words. And I please ask everybody to go and learn and research more um, about the work that Lazarus does about the movement and the survival of the Ogoni people. Thank you for joining us. Our final speaker um, that we have on our panel is Kulu Kasela. Kulu is a queer activist and community leader with majors in women and gender studies and political studies. They have worked with Equal Education, which is an organization that advocates for equality and equity in basic education in South Africa. In 2018, Kulu was elected to the hashtag Unite Behind inaugural secretariat, an organization that was set up to tackle state capture and corruption in the country. Kulu has been recognized by the Mail and Guardian top 200 young South Africans as one of the most influential young people in the country in 2020. Towards the end of the same year, Kulu worked with the Shisimani Center for Activist and Education to produce the Itakosa translation of the Pocket Queerpedia a toolkit of glossary terms used in and about the LGBTQIA plus community. Now Kulu is currently the educator, education coordinator at African Climate Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us Kulu, over to you. Thank you so much Bea. Um, you're all coming in after Lazarus's a bit, you know, because you know about these issues, um, but sometimes we tend to forget that there are real people, you know, on the ground that are bearing the brunt um, of these issues, like head on every day they wake up and, you know, and we have the privilege of sometimes not being um, at the forefront of those kinds of things. So just listening to Lazarus now, I'm just like, yo, this is very heavy. Um, and it's unfortunate that I bear more bad news. <laughs> um, but in any case, I think I'm just going to start by laying out a bit of the groundwork in terms of what we do at African Climate Alliance and, that how, and how that sort of aligns with what I do as an activist. So like you said, I'm an activist and I am sort of an activist across the board and I'm also an artist. So I do use a bit of my creativity to, um, amplify my voice and the voices of people like me out there. Um, and I've done quite a bit of work around climate change. I've done quite a bit of work around gender-based violence and intimate partner violence. I've also done a bit of work around um, the queer community and LGBT rights in South Africa and in Africa. Um, and so now I just sort of started working with the African Climate Alliance, which is basically a youth-led um, movement-based sort of organization. So we mostly just young people, you know, just trying to get climate justice and get our voices out there and get the voices of young people out there. Hence, we are movement-based. So um, it's not African Climate Alliance just deciding that, yo, this is what the young people want. It's young people in Africa saying, this is what's going on. And African Climate Alliance takes that and amplifies it and puts it out there. 
right? And we sort of operate, not sort of, we do operate from an African-centered perspective. So a very pan-African um, centered perspective, because there is this myth that is driven, especially in the African uh, community or just generally in the global South. Um, we have been fed this idea that climate change is a white problem. And that is simply because of how climate justice work has been packaged. Uh, it's been packaged in ways that doesn't reach people um, in places like Africa and in the broader uh, global South. So African Climate Alliance tries to then bridge that gap and brings climate justice to people and says, hey, this is a conversation that needs to happen right now and also needs to happen in Africa and in the global South. Because at the end of the day, we are the ones that bear the most brunt of climate change, even though we are like, the least contributing people, right? Um, and so now tying that in into the conversation that we're having uh, about the colonization of the climate or the climate of colonization, sorry. Um, we are coming from a standpoint of understanding that in the context of Africa as an organization that is based in Africa, we're coming from an understanding of the disposition uh, that African people have faced because of colonization. So the disposition in the uh, in the form of land, uh, in the form of over extractivism of our resources, um, though being uh, you know fossil fuels for most and other minerals, right? So we're coming from that kind of perspective and saying colonization came with a capitalist agenda and a racist agenda of wanting to over extract our resources um as a continent and while still trying to deal with that and trying to get reparations from that we are then presented with the issue of climate change as a direct result of the over extractivism of our resources in africa and on top of that we are then told well it's not really a black issue because you are right now worried about what you could possibly be eating for dinner tonight because you are poor and those kinds of things. So climate change is made to seem as though it is not a an immediate sort of struggle uh, for Black people and for African people. And so African Climate Alliance tries to bridge that gap and sort of say the dash for resources and the cutting of Africa and the underdeveloping of Africa as a pie um, by colonial powers has to come to an end. And we have to realize that that has reformed in a very neo-colonial and in a very neo-capitalist and neoliberal way that keeps on renewing itself and further entrenches um, the chains that African people have been sort of bound by over time. And this idea of over-consumerism and throwaway culture that we see coming from the West and we see coming from the global North, whereas, in Africa, we're being over extracted with our resources and we are facing the brunt of climate change because of that. But at the same time, we are still not able to enjoy um, the extraction of those resources and all of that. And that sort of brings me now to environmental racism, which also like really stems from the idea that climate change is not a black problem. And this comes from the fact that when we talk of climate change, we talk about saving the whales and all of that. Like I have nothing against whales, but honestly, I care more about the fact that my hut or my shack or my house might be washed away by a flood or that there's a famine um, that's been going on for the longest time in Somalia. That Cape Town itself had a drought where our water resource um, was threatened because our dams had dried out. Um, you know, so that presents now the fact that climate change is an immediate thing for Africans. And how do we then as young people make sure that we amplify our voices and say to other young people out there, this is a problem that is going on. And it is not a problem that has been caused by us as African people. It is a problem that has been caused by the West. And so how do we then demand justice from that? And it is it comes from centering people when we talk about environmental justice, when we talk about climate justice, because the issue that is out there is the fact that when we're talking about climate justice, we're always talking about the environment and we forget that people are also off the environment. And even though climate change is a direct cause of people, the people that are suffering have the least 
to do with it. And at the same time, they are part of that environment and deserve to be protected, right? And that's not to say that human beings are like more important than animals or like the environment as a whole and all of that. But that is also to just center people, particularly African people, because they are the ones, or like people in the global South generally, they are the ones that bear the brunt of climate change. And this idea that climate change is not really a problem that impacts you because you have more immediate things to worry about is an idea that we've been sort of indoctrinated with over time to believe that climate change is not really a big issue. It's an issue of the future. We have more immediate problems that we need to deal with. And this also speaks to the sort of access to spaces. Just before we started this conversation, we were talking with, um, with Louis about how Cape Town is so beautiful and all of that. But a lot of the Black people in Cape Town do not have access to all of these spaces that we think are beautiful. You know, Half the Black population in Cape Town has never been to Table Mountain, even though they were born and bred in Cape Town. They have not been able to access other spaces, the national parks, the National Botanical Gardens in Cape Town, but a lot of Black people do not have access to that. And that is due to apartheid and as also as a result of colonialism. And so this connection that we have with the environment has been cut and people have been indoctrinated into thinking that, well, climate change is an issue of the future. And at this point, we really have more pressing issues that are also a result of colonization that we have to deal with, that also keep on getting more entrenched and deeply entrenched because of capitalism. And then just now to bring it back, as I try to wrap it up quickly, in terms of what then can we do? What can we start doing as activists? What can we start doing as community members? What can you as Bayer that is in the United Kingdom can do to amplify this voice of African people that are hundreds of thousands of kilometers away from you. We first believe that you have to center people in whatever you're doing. So in as much as we're doing climate justice work, we understand it, that it forms part of social justice work. And we understand that it is important to have an intersectional justice, to understand that as a Kulu that is in South Africa, I am experiencing this in terms of climate change, but there is very different struggles that a Lazarus, for example, in Nigeria is experiencing or an Aledi in Lesotho that is experiencing. So how do we then respond to that as activists and community members and making sure that we support everyone adequately? Um, and we there's other things that also still run rampant as the world is falling apart. There's other things that are running rampant, like poverty, like gender-based violence and those kinds of things. And we find that women, for example, get abused in refugee camps in times of climate um, emergencies. And so how do we then, as these, organization, uh, these organizations, tender responses that are intersectional, that are understanding to each and every one of those problems, not sort of come with a blanket approach that just says, well, this is the solution we have, and that's about it, right? And also understanding the need for reparations. Currently, as, thing, as things stand, reparations for colonialism alone, for colonization alone, have not been tended in any way. I know that the UN is going to say, oh, but we had this, we had that. That is something that I deeply challenge because I feel like they have not dealt with it in not even in minute ways. A lot of countries are still under the, the rule and the power of their colonial powers. They're not able to operate and do anything. A lot of these companies that are over extracting us and that are burning fossil fuels in our countries are Western. I know like half the companies here are like British, the others are Dutch and American, all right? And so the reparations from that, the, rep the reparations from the dispossession, from the stealing, from the thieving, of colonial powers have not been done. So how do we then confront those reparations, packing on the reparations that should be coming um, as form of climate justice? So they definitely should be doing racial reparations for the disposition and the over-extractism that they did, they have done. Packed on top of that, they also should be tendering out reparations for the damage that they have done to our environment. Right. And then lastly, it is understanding that we have to carve and pave, um, you know, sustainable pathways, you know, because we we stand here right now. And as South Africans say that, yo, stop oil, you know, stop burning of fossil fuels, but also understanding that 
this at times is the livelihood of the people that stay in those communities, mining communities. People have jobs there. So when we're saying just stop oil or just stop fossil fuels, what alternatives are we giving to people? Because this is basically their bread. And so when we speak of pathways to systemic changes, we are also then realizing that yes, oil or fossil fuels or the burning of fossil fuels does this to the environment. But currently with the status quo, this is how the people see it to benefit them. So when we are trying to then replace this, how can we replace it with a way that is sustainable and also the people are still able to maintain their livelihood? Because it is important to maintain your livelihood, but in as just as much it is important for you to be able to survive um you know so those things go together you save the environment saving you basically but once you are saved what are you going to eat so we start we need to start thinking in those kinds of terms and unfortunately with the climate justice um you know space currently people most people who are in the climate justice space are people that are very privileged that don't have um I want to say capacity to not think about these issues in that manner because they stand from a point of privilege. And so it is important that we have conversations like this where a shell is going to say, but Lazarus, we're giving the people in your community jobs. But then we're able to say that as a Lazarus, as a Lazarus in our community and say that, but like you are giving jobs, but it is coming at such a high cost that we can't anymore. We need to come with systems that are sustainable, not only to the environment, but to the people that ultimately have to live in the environment. Because at the end of the day, the environment is not part of us, but we are part of the environment. And I think as human beings, as people generally, we have to start thinking in that manner that, yo, it's not our environment. We are off the environment. And so whatever that we are doing, we're not doing for the benefit of us, we're doing for the benefit of the environment. That at the end of the day is then going to ensure our survival because we are off the environment. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's been such great conversation um, and listening to the experiences, you know, from, from India, listening to the experiences from Lazarus, also listening um, to Louis that I take away from as a young African person, as a young African activist who has been pushing, but feel like we are going against the tide, you know, because in so many ways, our struggle is not legitimized because people do not understand how it connects with them. And it is important. And I stand now also myself here to be held responsible as a person that is an education coordinator of an organization in terms of how far and what a long way education can go. Popular education, it's very much important. We can go out there and we can protest and we can try and dismantle the system, but that will never happen without first undoing, with first unlearning and then relearning so that we able Whenever then we put something on the table, we know that it's sustainable. We know that we can carry it forward and it can carry us forward. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kuri. Yes, yes, that was magnetic. Um, it was incredible. I've been so hooked for all of this time, for all of our amazing, amazing speakers. Um, I've kind of gotten lost in your words and then, and then I forget that I'm meant to be facilitating this conversation um so thank you so much we due to time um we, we're just going we've been getting some q a some questions from the audience and because of time i i only have the time to ask one of them um unfortunately louis and valerie have had to go to other panels and events um but we still have three of our amazing panel left and there is a, a question that came up i think it's quite it's quite interesting and we'd love to hear just a little quick response from from Lazarus, Disha and Kulu as well. Um, somebody asked, what do you think is the main obstruction to intersectionality in the current narrative on, on climate justice? What's the main obstruction for this intersectional um, climate justice movement? Um, Disha, any thoughts we'd like to start with you? Yes, so uh, this is something I have actually thought about in the past and um, people who aren't intersectional have mentioned that they feel that talking about issues that are 
not their main focus. So let's say um, climate um, is their main focus and talking about something like, um, say, gender, they feel that it takes away from the main focus and um, makes it too complicated for people to understand. Um, and that uh, you don't have to care about every single thing. Or, um, so basically ideas along those lines. And I feel like when I've increasingly spoken to people who uh, focus on one issue and who are actively against intersectionalism um, have had similar ideas which I personally think um, is a huge obstruction because none of us live single issue lives and to assume that um, it takes away from it um, is very wrong because a lot of the issues intersect with each other and exasperate the the, the worst of it and it's really important to recognize that um, while some of these may not be, uh, well, well, they may not necessarily um, ensure that we will get the same kind of end result, it is important for our end liberation. And while they may not be the same, again, it is important for us to um, talk about it and talk about how the intersection can is causing problems, but can also be the solution. Thank you, Vicha. Thank you so much. Um, Azaris, is there anything you'd like to add? What, what's the obstacle of this intersectionality? <clears throat> the intersection uh, is just lack of understanding from people uh, of what these these things are. The 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 complications of it and you know how the the interrelationship which um should be able to benefit all of us if we understand why we have to do xyz at certain location and um abc at the other location you know um some people understand that oh yeah they are not part of that is not affecting them and because of that they don't want to take part in any of those that is not the solution to the problem when we talk about say for instance climate change it it will affect you whether it has not started it will come now when we talk about other other issues you know like racism or colonial Realism and all that. Some people think that oh, they have not actually seen that or experienced it, so they are not worried about it and all those things. But if we all understand that these things that people are raising are real issues, and then we see how we can provide solution to those problems based on what other people are saying, you know, then we can solve a lot of problems as a result of that approach. Yeah, definitely. Ignorance is one of our biggest, biggest enemies. Um, Kulu, is there anything, anything you want to add? Any opinion on, on this that you want to contribute? Um, so for me, I, I believe that it starts with us generally as activists, even before we go to our own communities um, and understanding that we are a product of our communities, right? But it starts with us as activists and understanding that, like Disha said, we don't live single issue lives. Um, we don't live single narrative lives. So our activisms shouldn't be single issue. Um, and I'm saying that at the risk of like us spreading ourselves too thin and I'm guilty of that um, because you just you just generally want to help right you want to do everything that you can um, but like it really comes with understanding that and understanding that at the core of it all we are all people despite our differences in sexuality in gender in ethnicity in race and that is like a problem that is very big 
in Africa, xenophobia by Africans towards other Africans. And I'm speaking as someone who is from South Africa, who has seen the amount of xenophobia and Afrophobia that South Africans have expressed towards other nations, right? Particularly African nations. And this is in particular towards to black people. So there is this sense of self-hate for lack of a better term that we have. And it's understandable that something like that would exist within us, right? When Steve Bugo speaks, um, Steve Bugo is a South African black consciousness um, leader uh, that died uh, during apartheid was killed by security police. Um, and he's, when he speaks of Black consciousness, he, need, he says that we need to self-actualize and self-determine as a Black people. And a lot of that right now is not happening. Um, we are still being told very much so how we are supposed to be as Black people. In South Africa, we call it the Swat Khafar, where Black men are told that you are supposed to be violent. You are a violent being. And so therefore, in society, you're seen as a violent being. So all of these ideas that haven't been entrenched in us, and saying, well, because you're Tosa and the other one is Zulu, you shouldn't be getting along, you know? So it comes with understanding that at the end of the day, we're all human. We all originate from one thing. And we must always remember that. Um, and we must always remember that that your life doesn't have much more value than the other person simply because of your sexuality or your gender or your race or your ethnicity. And I think that is like one of the first things, um, you know, um, that we need to overcome uh, um, in like this issue of non-intersectionality in our communities. And this is not to sound radical or anything like that, but it does sort of take us back to that conversation about the man-made borders um, that were basically drawn on Africa when it was being cut up like a pie and saying, we might not be saying like totally eradicate the borders, but do understand the fact that this was something that did not exist. They, like whoever the creator was or however the world was created, they didn't just like, you know, this straight line here will separate all of you and now you're different, you know, that type of vibe. So you must understand that we all come from the same thing and we all just people despite of our, of our differences in skin color and in other ways. And another thing, Africa, as I experience it currently, is a very homophobic country, um, homophobic continent as a whole. And this is also as a direct result of colonial laws, because half the African countries where being queer is criminalized, it's a remnant of colonial laws that were there. And so again, when we speak of reparations, these are the kinds of things that we've, we we want to be fixed, you know? When we speak of decolonization, we, when we speak of decolonizing systems, you know, and thinking of new pathways to do that, we're speaking about that. And that also speaks directly to intersectionality because the way that we reflect and see ourselves is something that we have learned over centuries and is something that is not going to be easy to just unlearn and learn new behaviors that, well, there's actually value to my life. There's value to what I do. There's value to the next person despite of their skin color and all of that. So I think the two connect and it's important that we realize that connection and again, realize our point of privilege. And I'm also realizing that right now I'm speaking from a point of privilege because I will go to bed without a worry that there will be a police officer knocking at my door because I said I'm gay on international internet, you know? But someone in Uganda, for example, cannot do that. You could be literally hung for saying that. So we, some of us that have that privilege, we should then be the voice for those that don't have the privilege to speak and also make sure that the point is gotten across that it is not a privilege, it is a right. We're simply calling it a privilege because right now it's a standpoint that we have, we have a vantage point that you have. That's why we're calling it a privilege, but it is a basic human right that you should have to express yourself however you want to express yourself, for you to have a healthful environment and be able to thrive in that environment, for you to not be kicked out of your property because they've discovered a guest pocket that they now want to mine, for our oceans to not be blasted for oil and those kinds of things. So I think, like I said, we don't live single issue lives, so we shouldn't have single issue activisms. And we must realize that everything goes together. But because simply because the 
climate is falling apart and climate change is happening, global warming is happening, it doesn't stop sexual assault. It doesn't stop transphobia. It doesn't stop homophobia. And so all of these have to be dealt with at the same time. It is not a distraction to deal with all of them because that is how it's supposed to happen. Mm, thank you so, so much. Um, we really could have keep, keep going forever. I definitely could. This, this conversation has been so enriching. Um, and and so insightful and i hope i really hope everyone um go and follow the amazing speakers we've had go look at their work look at the organizations that they work for um this panel tonight is just it doesn't stop here we continue we continue um but i'm so sorry because of timing we can't get to all of the questions and, and continue um asking these questions but to before we ease into the breakout rooms, um, firstly, thank you so much um, to our remaining pa panelists, Lazarus, Isha, and Kuru. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been so, so important and empowering as well. We're gonna hear now from um, Adil. And Adil will share some experiences of being a Just Stop Oil supporter before we go into the breakout rooms and, and share a bit about our experiences. Um, Adil is instrumental actually in the BAPOP community at Just Apoil as well. I, I couldn't do it with, without him. Adil is 30 years old. He's British born Pakistani and studied chemical engineering at UCL and chemistry at Leeds University. Adil came to London and has been working for the past five years as a data consultant and software architect. He's been involved in activism with and um, and with Just Stop Oil since July 2022 and participated in multiple action and is really helping to foster a community of civil resistance. So please put your hands together. Um, Adil, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bea. It's a, it's, a, it's a real honor to be to be able to share a few minutes of testimony with such an amazing panel of speakers. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of want to just share a little bit what it's been like uh taking action with just up oil as as one of the one of the few people of color and i suppose i i came to just up oil uh last year for many of the same reasons as other people it's seeing that there's injustice happening and 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 feeling a sense of responsibility to do something but it but i found myself wondering like why why am i the only only colored person in this in this roadblock you know, like, why aren't I joined by by more people of color? But I don't think that was enough to discourage me because, you know, the, this climate crisis, it doesn't understand, like, who caused it or who's innocent or who's who's, who's guilty. It's physics. It, it just it just happens. Right. And and, you know, it's and then I think more than that is, yes, you know, arrestability is, is a scary thing. It's it's uncomfortable. You know, I was you know, it's there's a lot of fear. Like, what are your friends and family gonna think? You know, what about your career? But it is that responsibility that that came through in the end. And I think after having taken action, so so for example, uh, a few months ago we took took part in this uh in the ECOP action, the East African crude oil pipeline, which is is being built by by Total Energies from you know starting in oil fields in Uganda and it's uh, stretching all the way to to the sea um you know like or you know taking part in this kind of action is is actually really empowering and as a as a person of color this is the start I start to realize that this is how you actually have leverage this is how you uh, are able to not just passively see injustice and you know you can actually like do something about it. I think that's it. You know, it's this is this is real empowerment. Um and you know, like we, we this country, Western democracies, they are completely paralyzed by by ignorance, by by passive passive passivity. And you know, like if 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 the rest of us are gonna let that happen, then then they it will happen. That's 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 kind of how power works. It 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 relies on everybody just going along with things and not not standing up when they see injustice. And 
yeah, I know. So I think this has been, a, a, you know, a tremendous experience to, to have been able to take action. Um, and, you know, I, th I think a lot of our speakers today have, have shown to us that uh, it's, it's the responsibility of, of, of colored people just as much as white people to, to realize that this is our planet, that, that we are part of this environment as well, like, like Kulu says. Um, so I think amazing positive things will continue to come out of this. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adil. Um, and just once again, thank you so much to our amazing speakers tonight. Um, if you have found this call particularly tough or, or emotionally challenging and would value some support, then um, we're going to post some links to our Resilience to Resist team and, and you can find a lot of support there. 